somebody made a comment on uh, Facebook regarding a um, posting I put up back on the 28th of July in which I was announcing my second or subsequent, I actually have had multiple editions of my ebook on Amazon, in which I renamed my book from its prior name, Extending the Range of Electric Vehicles by Maximizing Their Amp Hours, to give a different emphasis to the book, and basically republish it under a different title, The Heaviside Solution to the Ferranti Effect. And um, it's to highlight this nature of reactive power, something that conservative, conventional wisdom already is uh, quite aware of, and give it central focus, because it is the source of free energy. And it was Oliver Heaviside who comes to the rescue da -da -da -da, in correcting our misconception that it is useless, that it's only good for borrowing to energize coils in a motor, and then you have to give it back at the end of each half cycle of a of an electrical uh, alternating current cycle. It's ro that's, ro that's a wrong, erroneous assumption. We can convert it into usable power. It's a question of blending two opposing or contrary, I should say, um, zero power factored parent wave forms, uh, one being capacitive um, reactants and the other being inductive reactants, to create a daughter wave which is a standing wave of negative power factor, and then use the heavy side um, solution to of the transatlantic cable problem, the telegrapher's equation solution, to convert that negative power factor into positive power factor. And reactive power is limitless. There is definitely no limit to how much we can create per unit time. And this is how I explain it in this little diatribe here. Um, why don't I post it s to make it stable? And then I'll increase its size so I can see it, and you can see it. So he says, it is still not free power, because I end by saying uh, free power. That's the last stage I say about reactive power, so I'll, I'll, it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. Uh, what? Reactive power is not free? <laughs> Especially when you can uh, increase it to any degree? It is still not free power. Energy is not equivalent to nothingness. Interesting ideas, but weird language. Call it effective exploitation of cosmic sources of potential output. And avoid being branded as Wu Club Engineering. Um, well, Wu Club simply means that it's not accepted in general parlance. You know, that's really all it means. And effective exploitation of cosmic sources of potential output. Effective, the word effective means he's uh, highlighting the fact that I figured out something that, um, you know, I figured out how to do something. I figured out how to exploit cosmic sources of output, which are potential because they're reactive. But it's still free because it's more than what you put in. <laughs> I should say that. I hit reply. still free since its output is more than what is entered. Correct. Energy is not nothingness. You're halfway there. Energy is timeless, ultimately. It is we who put a measure of time upon it. Thus, energy is limitless in time, per time, per unit of time, moment to moment, despite our rationalizations to the contrary. This makes energy free power per time. And since one unit of energy per unit of a second is a vastly different impact than the same measurable unit of energy per century or per picosecond, the outcome is vastly different. This effectively is equivalent to free power since timelessness is free. The experience of timelessness is certainly at no cost to the individual. It takes absolutely no cost of human resources to meditate and experience this timelessness of the eternal moment within one's 
own self. I should say own self within ones. Uh, where is it? <laughs> one's own self. And this opportunity has been around since mankind began his, her existence well. Our appliances can also transcend the limitations of measurable time to at least have a glimpse of timelessness by accessing the free and potentially usable energy of reactive power and then convert this misnamed radiant energy into usable power per measurable unit of moment-to-moment -moment time. This confusion born of a lack of human dexterity of perceptual skills bears me out. It is this breadth of understanding, the versatility of time, which spans both timeless, eternal nowness, as well as the momentary now, which quickly fades and is replaced by another momentary now, which makes the conversion of timeless energy into temporal energy an effortless procedure for any human gifted in this department of energy magnification. That's a long sentence. <laughs> I wonder if anybody can follow it. This procedure is called by Eric Dollard the synthesis or decomposition of electricity from or back into its constituent ingredients of time and magnetism and dielectricity. But it is time which is the prime first cause of energy. The other two ingredients of energy are just there to fill out its skeletal structure and puts flesh on its bones, so to speak. For without time, there is no space. Without time, there is effectively nothingness. Time makes space possible along with everything inside of space. Hence, it is space and everything which we have come to know as stuff inside of space, which redefines timelessness into timeliness, the temporal aspect of time. This stuff inside of space undergoes constant change, as we are all well familiar. This changeable feature of space ignores timelessness in favor of the distractions of timeliness. This ignorance of our perception to appreciate this distinction is what is referred to as Maya, illusion. <laughs> Everybody get that now? <laughs> we are human beings capable of a huge breadth of understanding. Oh, let's, why don't I say it as I speak it? We are gods capable of a huge breadth of understanding and appreciation of the Almighty's, whoops, handiwork. Only our ignorance of ourself, of our Divinity holds us back. We misthink ourselves to be mere animals living a life of relative ease. And comfort confined to the limitations of the bed of coals known as karma inflicting fiery fiery how do you spell fiery fiery features of hell upon our existence to one degree or another. Misthink, I didn't re misspell that. There is such a word. Methinks? No, misthinks. Well, you wouldn't be with two S's. 
We must think ourselves to be mere animals living a life of relative ease and comfort, confined to the limitations of the bed of coals known as karma, inflicting fiery features of hell upon our existence to one degree or another. When in fact... We are gods capable of redesigning the life we're born into redesigning the life we're born into to refashion this world into any heaven of our choosing. Whoops, that's not how you spell choosing. Of our choosing. I guess it would be with a double O. We are gods capable of a huge breadth of understanding and appreciation of the Almighty's handiwork. Only our ignorance of our divinity holds us back. We must think ourselves to be mere animals living a life of relative ease and comfort confined to the limitations of the bed of coals, so to, uh, known as karma, inflicting fiery features of hell upon our existence to one degree or another, when in fact we are gods, capable of redesigning the life we're born into to refashion this world into a, any heaven of our choosing. I think that says it all. <laughs> I think that says enough, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> we all are quite aware of the sufferings and uh, privations we uh, ha are afflicted with, either of our own making or due to our own ignorance and of vulnerability, uh, the making of others who inflict it upon us. But of course, it's all karma. It's we all deserve it one way or another, because of something we've done. You know, because sometimes we pay back our karma not exactly. So you know, when it says an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in the Bible, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we're not capable of paying back our karma exactly the way we inflicted it in some far distant past lifespan that our soul is carrying around the debt of that uh, is shared with us along with all the other gifts of our soul, good, bad, and indifferent. So even though you and I did not do anything of, of any sort and then go, why me? When in fact, and the soul sa can say the same thing if it chooses because <laughs> it didn't have those things done to it either but it has the memory of all the prior incarnations that it associated itself with because it outlives these incarnations, although it has its own limit of existence, just a lot longer than w ours. And due to the fact that it embodies those memories, it imparts those debts to us because nature requires the payment, not the soul. Nature requires it, because of the balancing aspect of nature. Nature has to balance itself. So in f when, in, when, despite the fact that we never incur karma, yet we carry the debt of the karma of others who came before us. This is the uh, legacy of the parents passed on, to the heritage passed on to the children of the next generation. It works just as well with the soul transferring these debts to the next incarnation it's the same thing. You study genealogy, you're studying yourself, you're studying your soul. It's the same thing. It's a parallelism that's worth considering. Uh, so reincarnation doesn't have to, you don't have to believe in it if you don't want to. <laughs> Fuck it, you know, who cares? <laughs> Do you believe in your parents? Do you believe in what they have given you? That's enough. Because if you go and study your genealogy, you will see your karma written there. The soul is very particular in who it chooses to associate it, its next incarnation with. It chooses one that will highlight certain aspects of the historical record that is contained within itself of the prior incarnations that it has associated itself with within the human species. And so if you study your genealogy, you will know that 
aspect of your soul record of prior incarnations that need to come into focus for you to learn and grow and learn your lessons. You don't have to learn about anything else about your past ex uh, except it will be kind of, you know, inconsequentially unimportant if it's not there in your genealogy for, y for you to be focused upon. But regardless, focus or lack of focus, the soul's got it all there on record. And that's all the soul is, a r is a record keeper. You know, it doesn't get involved with all of this crap that we have to put up with. And yet it is this crap that we have to put up with that is the potential source of becoming divine. In as much as it's not going to come from materialism, obviously, it's going to come through the soul from the higher self when we open ourselves up to it. it it's a very funny juxtaposition in which the soul takes on the perspective of an animal, namely a human animal, who is ignorant of divinity because, you know, we're born of the womb. We're born of our mother's womb. How, how can we, as a human animal, be aware of divinity? We can't be if not for the higher self that the soul has access to, that in turn has access to the transcendent being that is God, or I should I say the nature of God, <laughs> making it possible for us to become gods in our own right, capable of manifesting our own creation within our own consciousness, should we choose to do so, should we, once we become aware of this salient feature to what we have access to through our soul. So, you know, our body's going to die, right? You know, but while we are alive, do we become, do we, do we gain access to that part of ourselves that the soul wants to share its, exp its access with us? You know, it, it's a strange juxtaposition because here's this soul who wants to share something beautiful with a human animal, something the human animal could not have access to otherwise had it not been for the soul to be there to give it access to, something that's outside of the five senses, outside of conceptualization born of experience through the five senses, something that is an inner experience and cannot be borne out by science, cannot be proven as a fact by science, because it cannot be proven by anything having to do with the five senses. Or, for that matter, the reasoning faculty, because the reasoning faculty can only justify various conclusions based on facts given, brought to it by its own five senses. But there's other sensibilities that are not physical, physically oriented that gives us data that cannot be verified by the five senses, cannot be, um, yes, verified. That's the word, verified. And so we call that taking it on faith when in reality it's simply believing in these other sensibilities is what it amounts to and not expecting all of the senses to be able to, qu to qualify all of our sensory experience. You know, sight can qualify touch, right? You see an object, you touch it, the two sensitivities of sight and touch qualify each other. But can intuition qualify what you touch? Yes, but can touch qualify intuition? No, it cannot. Because intuition comes prior to touch and all the other four senses. Intuition is a sense that transcends the five senses. That's why we call it the sixth sense. But it's more than the sixth sense because the senses are grouped in groups, blocks. The five senses are one block, but the other sensibilities be, uh, other than the five senses are another block. And they're two separate blocks that, don't ca that cannot qualify each other. They qualify themselves. And we, the human are a multiplexing individual. We're more than animals. 
we have an animal aspect, but we, we're capable of multiplexing because we've got one block of senses, the five senses, that are physically oriented. Then we have another block of senses that are not physically oriented. And both are part of the human experience. So it's, we're actually more um, gifted than the angels of heaven. They, uh, they can envy us if they wish, although they don't because <laughs> they know what hell we have to go through to live this multiplexing existence. They're, they're in no grand rush to come in, into our world and become human because they know how quickly they'll be swept up by the materialistic aspect of our existence and be lost, just as we have been lost for ages. They're in no grand rush to rush in here. But they know they will have to eventually, if they wish to become almighty beings, capable of manifesting their own creation within their own consciousness. Right now, they're just servants of the Almighty. The same Almighty that created the creation that we live in, that they are servants of, willing servants of. Yet, because they have not been lost to the five senses, their vision has not been blurred, has not been distracted by the five senses that we possess, they only possess the inner senses, the block of inner senses that we also have, but they do not have the five physical senses. So they don't get distracted. They don't get lost and caught up in this maya, this illusory world of physicality. They, they utilize all the other subtle senses that are non-physical, the intuition, the higher sensibilities. Yet we have access to both blocks of sensibilities the physical and the non-physical, both together. And our job is to integrate them, to integrate them into our consciousness so that it becomes so spontaneously effortless that we walk in two worlds, one foot in the absolute and one foot in the rel relative and everything else in between, and become a fully integrated human being. That's what the Bhagavad Gita talks about, a fully integrated mind of... A, uh, what do they call it? A resolute intellect is what they call it. A resolute intellect. Why resolute? Because it's resolute in the full capacity of the human being to experience existence. The, the aspect of existence that our five senses tell us, our animal nature, and the other block of sensibilities that have nothing to do with physicality whatsoever. They're there still in the relative creation, but they're so subtle and refined that they have nothing to do with physicality and the laws of physics, for that matter. The law, <laughs> you know, it says in the in the, in the Vedas somewhere. Uh, how does the expression go? He who is not open to that reality, what can these Vedas do for him? But he who is open to it is established in it firmly. It's, 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 it's like, you know, talking to a wall when you're talking to somebody who doesn't really have any uh, receptivity to this sort of uh, knowledge because they're just not open to it. So it's like uh, beating your head against the wall. But if you're open to it, you already know what I'm talking about, and I'm just preaching to the choir. So it's a strange uh, duality of uh, extremes and there's no wiggle room, you, you're no fence sitting like, well, I'm not sure really, I haven't made up my mind, you know, and I don't think so. <laughs> you can doubt your experience and that'll make it appear to you that you're a fence sitter. Oh, we're totally capable of doubting our experience, creating confusion that need not be created. But you either have the experience or you don't have the experience and whether or not you doubt your experience is a whole nother matter in itself. Um, it's very important not to doubt our experience um, because that's all we have is our experience, you know. We can uh, listen to Vinny talk uh, his mouth off, but who cares what Vinny says, you know. It's what you yourself experience that uh, is all that matters. And if it is your experience, then you already know what is fact. Yet that's all you know what is fact. And just because we are capable of experiences that we have yet to experience doesn't mean we can't experience it. It just means we have not experienced it yet. And that's the whole point of meditation is 
not to become part of a cult, certainly, which some think that's all it's for, and some willingly want that. It's to open up our experience. When I first started meditating, I, I knew right away that there was something here that is not part of normal human experience, transcending relativity and going to something that is indescribable. It, it, I, I couldn't put words to it. it, it was inc I was incapable of it because you can't really. All you can say are the benefits and that's what I do all day long. I talk about what the benefits have been in terms of my ability to transcend the temporal aspect of existence and experience the timelessness of the eternal now and preach what that means in terms of electrodynamic theory, namely free energy. Because that's the practical aspect of transcendental meditation or any practice of yoga is, okay, what's it good for? Okay, you come out into activity as a householder, not as a recluse. What is it good for? Well, it's to do what Buckminster Fuller said. To we have a responsibility to redesign the world as we find it to make it a better world. Uh, who cares what, what karmic uh, situation we're born into? What are we doing about it? To, make it? to leave it as the backpacker, or the hiker, the camper is told to do. To leave your campsite in better shape than you found it. Cart out your trash, you know. Cart out the other, everybody else's trash that they, that <laughs> they flagrant or flagrantly left behind at the campsite. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about improving the situation as you find it, regardless of what situation you find it in? Hey, you know, uh, uh, what's her name? Anne Francis, was that her name, who uh, ended up dying in the concentration camp just before uh, the concentration camp was liberated by the Allies at the end of World War II? She made the best of her situation, you know? What can you do? You find yourself in a situation and you make the best of it. You try to make it better than the what shape you find it in. And the whole process of meditation is to speed that up, to accelerate it. So when I study surges that accelerate to infinite oblivion, in a sense, I'm just studying my nature because transcending is an exponential dive into oneself in which one dives at an ever-accelerating pace such that the more you dive, the more quickly you dive. It just escalates it, the diving process. The process itself escalates. And it, it starts out slow, and that's why it takes patience to meditate. You just got to sit there and, you know, be patient with it. You know, you don't force it. There's nothing to force. You just be patient with it because it automatically escalates, just like the surges that I study. So everything I've been dealing with is simply a refabrication of my meditation experience into the experience of electrodynamic theory, which is what the simulator, which is an appliance, which is what I state up here, an appliance that can have a glimpse of that process of yoga, that process of meditation, it too can have that, a taste of that, just as a meditator can have a taste of that during each meditation or potentially during each meditation, you know, <laughs> mileage varies, right? <laughs> each meditation is never the same as the prior one and never will be and you can't expect it to be. But they do bear out certain similarities over time that tends to be especially the good aspects worth n making note of, and that's what we want to repeat in our machines, in our appliances. That experience of transcending the limitations of energy within a confine of a storage unit, such as a battery, and making more use out of that battery. You know, it may have one amp hour, but maybe I can effectively put a circuit attached to that battery that'll get 10 amp hours out of it had I not put that circuit attached to that battery. And so now my light bulb will last 10 times longer, shining the same amount of luminosity over a longer span of time. And that's what I try to point out in this article, that w I'm stretching time, I'm not stretching the energy. The energy is the same. And this is something that physics won't allow us to be flexible in because they avoid and ignore the factor of time. 
Despite Eric Dollard saying there are three ingredients to electricity, the most important one and the only one that anybody has to focus on is the factor of time. Magnetism, dielectricity, that's just the mechanics. Like, you know, how do you build a house? Well, you use uh, wood uh, timber and you use nails and you hire a construction crew. Those are all details. The true feature of, uh, of energy in general and electrical energy in, in particular is the feature of time. If you can manipulate time, you can manipulate the universe, you can dissolve the universe, you can manifest a whole new one if you like. These are all yogic siddhi powers that are all come out of time. The third eye chakra is all about time. And although I was born with this um, feature to my awareness, it took a lifetime to appreciate it. Because in prior ages, we didn't have technology and science to give a vernacular such as we have today. You know, it was all wrapped up in spiritual uh, terminology and religious terminology and kind of vague, you know. So science does provide a kind of particularity or a um, uh, ref uh, 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 a, a focus. It provides a focus of terminology to be able to talk about something in very discrete terms. So you can be very precise about what you're saying, even though it's coming out of timelessness, which is sounds kind of vague, <laughs> source, you know? <laughs> Yet, to make something discrete out of something that is timeless is really what the production of free energy amounts to. You know, that's what I'm trying to imply in this little diatribe here. Um, anywho, I just had to get that out. It w it's a beautiful question that he posed because, you know, he's focusing on nothingness and yet nothingness, um, one could get misled into thinking that that's spatial in orientation and forget about the timely aspect to what seems to be nothingness. See, this nothingness is the... Um, the perceptual uh, outlook of a uh, somebody who is caught up in the theology or ideology, if you prefer, of um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, the void. You know, if you if you get caught up in the void, then you're still stuck in space, the five senses, and you don't understand time. You know, time may appear to be nothing to you. <laughs> it's everything to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so palpable when you experience the bliss, the ananda of timelessness, transcendent to timeliness, the temporal aspect of time. I, it's so palpable, I, it's undeniable. And you can experience it in the body, because Maharishi Mahesh Yogi talks about it in The Science of Being and the Art of Living, how the meditation process connects all aspects of the person's consciousness with each other. That's wh why I said f a fully integrated human being. I it connects um, prana, the life force, with consciousness. I it connects prana with the mind. I it connects the senses with the mind, the body with the senses. You know, there's so many different aspects of the human being making up the multiplex of our experience that all have to be connected and fully functionally integrated. So we got the life force, the prana, which of course is energy. We've got the consciousness, which is the, our foundational existence. We got the mind, the instrument of our that coordinates everything. We got the five senses. Uh, what else did I leave out? We got feelings. I mean, we got so much stuff going on inside ourselves. We got the intellect that rationally thinks things through. Um, and then, of course, we have the stream of consciousness, which is an endless stream of thoughts. We don't even have to make an effort to think a thought. Uh, it, they just keep coming, you know. So we got all these different features. Um, and the bonds between them have to be strengthened so that when we take a look at timelessness, we can make a sense, we can make sense out of Time, timeliness. 
you know, the timeliness of moment-to-moment temporal existence that changes and is replaced, you know, one physical reality is replaced by the next physical reality, each moment-to-moment. You know, those are two different ways of looking at the same thing we call time. So time has this dual nature. It straddles two worlds. (laughs) It straddles a world of non-change along with the world of change. And this is the world that electrical energy lives within, uh, in particular electrical energy. All energy does, but it's electrical energy that gets our awareness focused on the most fundamental aspect of energy in general. You know, it gives us a particular example such that we can focus on this um, junction between the two worlds of change versus non-change that electrical energy is so good at straddling. Um, I guess that says it best. (laughs) How else are you going to say it, you know? (laughs) It's hard putting words to this stuff. (laughs) It's it's not easy, but that's the one of the benefits of meditation is to develop the intellect to be able to talk about this stuff too. To be able to organize your thoughts so that it's not just a ramble jumble although it may sound like a ramble jumble to some of you. <laughs> makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> but see, now that's my experience. It may not be your experience, but it can be if you want it to be. <laughs> you may think I'm nuts, <laughs> and then you don't want it to be. <laughs> hey, it's your choice. <laughs> Trust me, you'll get to this point eventually, even if it takes aeons. <laughs> hey, there's no hurry. <laughs> it could take two million years if you want it to be. Just don't let it take too long, because Mother Nature may put a fire on your underneath your buttocks to get you to move your butt <laughs> if you should take too long. <laughs> the whole point of yoga is to speed things up, but we don't want to slow things down either. <laughs> so if you want to ramble along, you know, nice and gradual, somewhere between the two extremes of very slow and very fast, hey, that's your choice. <laughs> Be it as it may, that's your choice. <laughs>